Okay, uh, so we're going to have Jonathan Drieger come up. He's from the um, Win uh, Winnipeg area, and he's with FarmLink Marketing Solutions, and he's going to be giving us a, um, a marketing outlook on, on the wheat and, and uh, mainly and, and all our other crops. So if Jonathan will come up, we'll be ready to go. Well, thanks for that uh, introduction, Craig. And uh, um, you know, it, w it was good. I actually had an opportunity to uh, to meet Craig uh, yesterday evening. And uh, you know, my uh, my adventure getting here is is similar to uh, to many others. Uh, you know, I uh, uh, was going to fly out of Calgary, fly into Lethbridge here, and. Uh, uh, so, of course, you know, with the weather and everything, my flight was delayed by about three hours from Winnipeg to Calgary, which means that I missed my connection down into, uh, uh, into Lethbridge. And so uh, the question is, do I get here? Do they even let me on the plane in Winnipeg to get to Calgary? Because I won't be able to get to Lethbridge. And so scramble and last minute managed to get the uh, pretty much perhaps maybe the last rental car available at Calgary Airport, which was great. So we'll drive down. And so instead of getting in kind of mid second half of the afternoon, I kind of tumble in around middle middle of the evening. and find my way downstairs, throw the bags in the room, find my way downstairs, which was great, and grab, you know, grab some food and, uh, and grab a beverage and so on, and, and so, which was good. And so just by chance, happened to, uh, happened to bump into Craig. And uh, so one, you know, one of the first things that he mentions is, you know, I sort of apologize that I missed the first part of your routine here, and, and you know, perhaps it was 12 hours in transit. I didn't quite maybe fully understand what was happening and realized after a couple minutes that he mistook me for the uh, comedian last night. <laughs> Now, that in and of itself, I guess, you know, I mean, okay, so we're maybe three beers into a, uh, you know, 13-beer evening, perhaps, or whatever it is, so, you know, I didn't think too much of it, and, uh, you know, until I realized that actually, uh, it, you know, the same thing happened to me again a little bit later on, and, and, you know, I hand this gentleman a business card, and the first thing he says, you actually have a real job. Now, I don't know if market analyst is, you know, can be classified as a real job, but, okay, and so, you know, by the time it happened a third time, I figured I better get the record straight here a little bit before we even get started. A big part of our job is managing expectations, because, you know, as a market analyst, you know, people expect you to hit home runs and expect you to be right and all those sorts of things. And so, uh, you know, we certainly, when we sit down with a client, we want to make sure that their expectations are in line with, uh, with what we think we can perform from a market analysis perspective. And uh, so just to make sure we have expectations set properly here, I'm not the comedian, I'm not very funny, so if you mistook me for that, uh, you know, when I walked up here, uh, let, let's get that straight right from the get-go. So anyway, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time here just uh, just talking a little bit about really what's been going on in the market here because we've we've had some pretty dramatic changes in terms of some of the underlying fundamentals in really pretty much all of the crops that we've uh, that that we grow here in Western Canada and and worldwide and so I think it's really really important that we understand what's been going on because the the implications in terms of from a price perspective in terms of how markets behave, you know, in terms of the ability of, of, of being able to move your crop and the right decisions for, for marketing your crop and so on are, are pretty important. And so, uh, you know, more than, than just sort of an outlook about, you know, peas higher, lower, canola higher, lower, whatever like that, I, I think it's important more than anything to try and, and sort of frame, you know, the, the bigger picture. Because in a lot of these cases, the story doesn't change that much from one crop to the next. So it, it, it's kind of really the bigger picture here that's changed and, and it's, you know, it's important to understand. Just a real brief, brief uh, background on farmling marketing solutions. Um, we're based out of Winnipeg. We've been in existence for about 10 years now, and basically our job is, is to work with farmers in Western Canada to try and help them market their crops. Basically try and, and, and help you guys make the best marketing decisions you can, and within that process also try and reduce a lot of the stress that comes with, with making marketing decisions. We, we kind of really feel like we're you know, trying to act as that, as that rational, sober voice in the conversation. You, it's often a very emotional thing, especially when markets have been as volatile as they have been. And so, uh, uh, you know, that's really where we, we feel we have, 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 uh, have our role. Um, I'm part of the analytical team in Winnipeg, so you know, our job is basically trying to figure out what's going on in these markets, you know, are they going higher and lower, and, and, and how to make, you know, good marketing decisions around that. We have marketing advisors across Western Canada, and so my colleague here, uh, uh, Chris Vinadol, who works out of Coaldale, he works for us in southern Alberta, and so he's got farms that he works with uh, individually and, and basically helps take those, those uh, things that we see in Winnipeg from a marketing perspective in the bigger picture and really try and drill them down to the individual farm level because as we know everyone's farm is different and so I can sit in Winnipeg and think that it makes a lot of sense to sell 25% of new crop canola or whatever it is. Reality is is that it might not make sense in some farms, some farms should maybe sell more, sell less, whatever it is and so that's where uh, 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 Chris and, and the rest of our team in Western Canada uh, sort of have that role to, to really individualize those, uh, those, those decisions. 
you know, just a brief overview of a variety of different service packages. We have two packages called Business Link and Advisor Link, which again is where you work with a marketing advisor one on one with your farm. Uh, we actually have a newsletter that we also put out where we have our analysis and our sales recommendations, which we call Strategy Link. We have a program that actually has online training and hedging recommendations called Hedge Link. You know, in this new environment, in this new world that we're in, um, you know, we're certainly finding more and more farms are, are realizing that they got to look at, at new and more tools to manage risk and, and, and help uh, with, their, with their marketing. So uh, just a real brief overview of, of, uh, of some of the, the programs we have. Actually, what we do have is, is if anyone is interested, we do have a, uh, a two-month free trial for our Strategy Link newsletter. And if you go to this, uh, this link on the website, and you'd have to type in this link directly. Basically, you know, we, we appreciate being a part of this event. And, and uh, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's great to have a great turnout in spite of the weather. And, and so uh, part of reflection of that appreciation is, is uh, if you, you won't be able to access this link through our main page. But if you type in this link, you can have a free trial to our newsletter. We're also actually offering some discounts as well. There is some information out in the hallway. We're sharing space with the point set out there on the <laughs> in the hallway, but we do have some brochures, or else grab myself or Chris during the day, and, and you know, happy to happy to chat. I'm around all day, and, and in the evening, I only fly out tomorrow morning. So, uh, if anyone has any interest or any uh, questions, uh, you know, by all means, we'd uh, we'd love to uh, love to chat. So, uh, we often get asked to do market outlooks, and and you know, which which, uh, which is great. But but I just wanted to take a minute to talk about the difference between uh, a market outlook and making good good marketing decisions, because they're not always necessarily one and the same thing. And as I mentioned about managing expectations, I mean, the truth is, in terms of, of a market outlook, I can give you a market outlook, and basically, the market outlook is only as good as until something actually changes, which could be, you know, the next day or or next week or next month or whatever the case is and suddenly you know suddenly that whole outlook you know changes and so outlooks quite frankly get stale very quickly and so you know when we think about making good marketing decisions for our clients there's actually a number of different aspects to it so one of them obviously of course is forecasting i mean you do need to have an opinion about what's going on in the market no doubt you have to understand what's happening you have to understand what's going on you need to have some opinion about what you think is going to happen going forward you know but that's only one part of it um, Risk management is, is a huge part. I mean, sometimes we'll sit there and make marketing decisions and sales decisions not necessarily just because of what we think will happen, but often as much it's, it's about managing about what we are not sure will happen or, or what might happen, even if it's not the most likely scenario. Uh, there's a, a, a trader out of New York. His name is Nassim Talib, and he's written a number of books, Black Swan and Fooled by Randomness and so forth. And he talked about when he was a trader in, uh, in New York, uh, he'd sit down, have his meeting with his boss, and his boss would be sitting around the table, the other traders in the room, and they'd ask him, you know, what position you got on, and he'd tell, you know, he's short this, or he's long that, or whatever the case is. He said, what do you think the likelihood of that, that trade working out is? He said, maybe 30%. So what are you, what are you doing? Put on a trade where you think there's only a 30% chance of working out. Well, if it happens, I'm going to make about a 300% return on this trade. So in my mind, a 30% likelihood, but a 300% return is pretty good. In his mind, that's a better trade than maybe there's a 60% chance of likelihood of it happening, but only making 20%. Now, I mean, you know, trading on a screen in New York and, and managing far marketing decisions obviously are two different things, but it's just a reflection of the fact that sometimes, you know, it, it's not just a matter of this is we think the most likely scenario, but sometimes it's a matter of from a risk management perspective, maybe we've got to sell some grain because even though we don't think something will happen, if it does happen, maybe the implications are pretty significant and we can't ignore that. And then the last part of that is, is constraints. You know, we deal with about 400 farms across Western Canada uh, quite intimately in terms of, of dealing individually with marketing advisors and really getting in depth with the marketing on their farm. And uh, I really wish that uh, all of them could sit there and say, we never have to sell grain to manage storage space. We've never had to sell grain to try and generate cash flow to make a payment or that sort of thing. The truth of the matter is, is that the percentage of clients that make selling decisions only because markets higher or lower and never have to think about any other practical aspects of their farm, pretty tiny, right? Often you guys have reasons why you gotta sell grain that aren't just market higher, market lower. You gotta manage space, you gotta manage cash flow, you gotta manage payments. Uh, one of the other constraints we're dealing here in Western Canada, are we actually able, going to be physically able to move all this grain? So uh, you know, and, and that's a that's a kind of a a Western Canadian constraint this year. We'll talk about a little bit later. But you know, really, it's the combination of all these things that come in to make good marketing decisions. Which which again is is uh, is just simply a little different than than just uh, trying to give you a market outlook, which uh, which which do quite frankly get stale uh, very quickly. So we think about. Uh, um, 
you know, what, what's going on in, in the market and, and the sort of things that we look for. And uh, here's a quote from Donald Rumsfeld, which actually, you know, kind of left people's heads scratching when he, when he said it. And yet there's actually uh, uh, quite a bit of wisdom in this if you think about it. And so using this as a bit of a, uh, a, a, bit of a guideline for how we're going to approach some of the things we want to talk about here. So he goes, there's the known knowns. These are the things we know that we know. There are the known unknowns. That is to say, they're the things we know we don't know. But there are also the unknown unknowns. These are the things we don't know we don't know. And, you know, there's that element of that in, in, in market forecasts. You know, there's things that we know with some certainty and confidence. There's things that we don't know what's going to happen, but we know to kind of look for them. We can make, you know, sort of estimate and make some expectations around that. And there's sometimes things that come out of left field that you just had no idea was coming. And uh, all of those things have a direct impact on the prices of the crops that we're trying to sell. So let's start with the known knowns. And basically these are, these are facts that we know, things that we have a certain amount of confidence in, things that we feel, you know, pretty, you know, pretty high degree of probability that this is either what they are or what they will be, uh, will be going forward. And, and the truth is what we have here, and, and this, is, this is really important, is the fact that we just have big production worldwide in most crops. And we had a StatsCan report that came out this morning that pretty much blew everyone's hair back in terms of the size of pretty, the crop of pretty much everything. Pretty much everything came in well above even the highest of expectations. Canola was the one exception where it basically was right at the highest of expectations. You know, so we just, there is just a lot of grain out there. There is a lot of grain out there and that is really different than what we've seen in the last couple of years. And that's, you know, that, that, that really changes a lot of things and the implications of that, you know, could impact how these markets behave for the next, not just this year, but maybe the next couple of years going forward. Um, demand is strong. You know, we do have good demand and that helps and particularly for oil seeds. You know, one of the good things that canola has going forward is that you, we got great demand for canola. There's strong demand for soybeans and so that's one of the saving graces for the, for the oil seed complex. Um, movement is a struggle. We'll talk about that a little bit, but you know, movement is a little bit of a challenge in terms of just being able to get all of this crop moved. And, and all of this means that, that, quite frankly, markets are going to be behaving differently here uh, than they have been uh, over the last number of years. So if you think about last year and the last several years, I mean, we had tight stocks in pretty much, pretty much all crops. Okay? Pretty much everything was, was very tight from you know, corn and feed grains to oil seeds to pulses. You know, there weren't very many markets that, that weren't quite tight. The cupboards were bare. The cupboards are not bare anymore. Okay, we, we've just rebuilt supplies in pretty much, pretty much everything. And so, you know, again, we think about market behavior. So the last couple of years, we had markets that were extremely sensitive to even minor changes in supply. Uh, you know, over the course of the year, there's about four or five USDA reports that, that really, you know, really have a big, big impact in terms of how the entire market views the fundamentals going forward. I mean, they, they put out reports all the time and they all, you know, they all matter, they all give us useful information, but there's kind of about four or five of them where, you know, the markets anticipate weeks in advance and, and traders are squaring up positions a full week ahead of time and everybody just kind of, you know, clenches their fist, white knuckling, waiting for that number to come out because you know at least one crop and maybe several are going limit up or limit down and you have no idea and half the time it's one and half the time it's the other and you just don't know. That's how markets behave. It's just the volatility in these markets was just unbelievable these last few years and that's just how markets behave when supplies are really, really tight. And we are just not seeing that anymore. Um, we had a, a USD report in early November, and it was, it was a pretty important one. It was one of those that, that ordinarily would have been one of those real key reports. On top of that, because the, the children uh, in Washington you know, were bickering and they couldn't get their act together, they put a bunch of government people out of work for a few weeks. You know, they actually missed a report in between, so it was kind of a double report, a bunch of key information. You, you know, everybody anticipating what's going to happen. The number comes out. Market hardly moved. I mean, it moved a little bit. Market didn't move that much. And we just, we just have not seen the volatility in any of these markets anywhere near what we've seen the last number of years. And that's, you know, that, that's probably not going to really change. I mean, markets ebb and flow for sure. You know, there's periods when you know, it's going to rally. It's going to make a sharper move. Nothing like we've seen the last couple of years. And I don't think that's going to change. Last couple of years, we've had tremendous basis levels for, for canola. Just unbelievable basis levels. Record high. Just phenomenal. Uh, this year, average, maybe wider in a lot of cases, right? Basis levels are wide note. Inverted futures markets, this year we got carry in the futures market. And, you know, it's just quite frankly, you know, more of a, a buyer's market. You know, in the last couple of years, any kind of a price pullback, you had a lot of buying support. If you're an end user of corn in the last couple of years, any kind of price pullback, you were all over that trying to get coverage because if I don't buy it today, what am I going to have to pay for it if I drag my feet and wait? This is maybe my opportunity, I'm going to go buy it. It's not the case anymore. You know, if you're an end user of corn or feed grains, 
what's the rush? Why the hurry? There's a ton of this stuff out there, right? So you just don't have that same kind of urgency on pullbacks. So, you know, all of these things again, and it's not just a price up down thing, but, but also just how markets behave in general. You know, I, I, can't, I can't overstate the importance of, of this one uh, particular chart because this, this really, uh, really kind of tells the story of, of just about everything. This, this is a graph of, of ending stocks for corn. And uh, basically what ending stocks are is, is what's left at the end of a crop year. And it really, you know, so, so, you know, through the fundamental analysis, supply and demand, you know, how much crop we grew, how much is left, how much we're going to use and all that. And basically what tumbles out of the bottom is how much you think is left at the end of the year. And it really is your, your measuring stick for how tight a market is or, or isn't. And so, you know, the ending stocks is really what ultimately what drives markets. And so really kind of tells us, you know, a lot about what we think is going to happen or is going to happen or has happened and so forth. And, and this graph, you know, actually looks, you know, uh, you know, canola would look very similar as some other crops, but, but corn is such a huge important crop. So if you look over the last number of years, you just saw those, those ending stocks just keep getting lower and lower. And, and I mean, last year, I mean, it was just unbelievable how tight that corn market was last year. It was just unbelievable. There was just, there was just almost no corn around, you know, and, and the impacts on so many of these other markets, you know, so there's like no corn around. And so corn is scrambling and fighting and, you know, fighting for acres. And so what does that do? It means soybeans and everything else fights for acres. And there's no corn around, so we're feeding a whole bunch of wheat. So now there's a whole bunch of wheat disappearing in the livestock because there's no corn around to, uh, you know, to feed or the corn's really expensive. So now wheat becomes competitive as a feed grain. And all these things, you know, all these things were happening the last couple of years, you, you compared to where we're at today. And, you know, so, you know, in this graph, you know, it's close to 2 billion bushels is what they're thinking is going to be left at the end of this crop year. That could very well be too low. It might be even more. And, you know, it, it's uh, in basically one year, you know, we've restocked the cupboards for, for corn. And uh, corn is so important, you know, because as you look into next year, okay, well, corn can now give up easily, reasonably comfortably, maybe four or five million acres. Well, where are those going to go? Those are going to go to soybeans, maybe some in spring wheat. Well, what goes into soybeans impacts canola, and on and on it goes, you know. And so, you know, the implications of, of this are, are pretty huge. And the other thing as well, um, you know, it's uh, the thing about, you know, when, when you ration demand, like we have the last couple of years because there's no corn around, right? You know, you liquidate a whole bunch of livestock herds, you liquidate a whole bunch of hogs, you liquidate a whole bunch of cattle. It's not like, oh, now we got corn, let's, you know, let's, we got a whole bunch more cattle to feed. No, there's a life cycle, right? It takes time for those, that demand to come back. And so you can ration demand quickly. It's hard to get that demand back in some markets. It's a little bit like if I skip lunch, I'm probably not going to eat two suppers, right? You know, and, and it's a little bit the same way with, with demand rationing. And, and, but the thing is, it doesn't happen the same way on the supply side. And so, you know, like for example, you know, if I can get a good show of hands here, how many farmers in the room are going to idle a whole bunch of land on their farm next year because the price of wheat is down? Right? Maybe a couple of hands go up. I mean, you guys are going to plant it. You guys are going to plant something, right? It might not be wheat if the, you know, if the price of wheat sucks and you can't make any money on it, but you're going to plant something. And the farmers in the U.S. are the same way, and farmers worldwide are the same way. The grain gets growing, right? So it's not like the price isn't very good. Now we're just going to pull a whole bunch of land out of production. It's not going to happen, right? And so whereas demand can get rationed, it takes a hard time to come back. You know, the, the supply thing, uh, just it takes time to work its way out. And so... You know, now next year, maybe corn acres are down a bit, but if they have another decent yield and demand is rationed, well, then maybe, you know, the pile stays the same or maybe even gets even bigger. And maybe this cycle continues again for a period of time. So, you know, that's, that's really important to think about, not just in terms of what's my grain worth this year, but how do we think about, you know, going forward the next couple of years with markets behaving and, and expectations and, and, you know, what to plant and how we're budgeting and so far, so forth. So, you know, that's, that's really... You know, the corn one is kind of a big deal because it impacts so many other crops. If it was only corn, it would be one thing, but, you know, the, the graph actually looks similar in some other crops as well. You know, the one thing about oil seeds, as I mentioned, they got really strong demand, and that's, that's, really, uh, that's really helped, uh, you know, canola. Uh, soybeans as well, obviously not a big soybean growing region here. It, you know, is, it's growing as a crop in, in Western Canada, but, uh, you know, a hugely important crop, obviously, you know, soybeans is a key part of, of what, you know, where the value of canola is. And so, you know, that, that we have, you know, the oil seeds have really benefited from strong demand. 
also helps that you know South America grows a ton of it, but they often have a hard time getting it to where it needs to go. You know, so there's logistical challenges, with, you know, which which helps support it a little bit. Oil seeds, you know, soybeans, you know, is actually reasonably tight in the in the shorter to medium term. Canola is not that tight, but soybeans are reasonably tight in the short to medium term, at least until you know we start getting that next South American crop off, which is kind of into the second half of winter. You know, and and so uh, you know it, it is. You know, the, the graph for soybeans doesn't look quite the same as it does for corn, you know, and that's, and that's helped supporting the, the OLC complex to, to a certain degree. One of the concerns a little bit is, is Chinese demand. I mean, China takes, you know, over 60% of global soybean imports. So, I mean, they really are the big elephant in the room when it comes to soybeans and oilseed imports. You know, are they going to be able to, are they going to continue to import at the same pace? And, you know, I mean, there's questions about, you know, the vulnerability of their economy and stuff like that. And people have been predicting catastrophe there for several years. And somewhere along the line, they continue to grow at, a, at an impressive clip. You know, perhaps it's coming. That's possible. But, you know, certainly that's, that's a bit of a, you know, something to watch. The other part of it is, you know, some policy changes in China, which maybe have some, we've sort of been on our radar for a little bit. It's sort of starting bubbling a little bit in the news wires and stuff. You know, which which maybe impacts how many soybeans they import and so forth. You know, it's it, it, it's something that we're we're definitely monitoring. Although you know, so far they've been they've certainly been impressive buyers. This graph might be very confusing, so I'm going to just try and explain it as briefly as I can. And it's basically as much as anything to illustrate a point. So those those lighter shaded blue bars that go all the way to the end is basically what uh, weekly U.S. soybean export sales last year. Okay, so that was what, you know what they did last year with soybeans in terms of export sales week after week. The, uh, the, the blue line is basically what the projections are for soybean exports during the coming year. You know, roughly what it would need to be on a weekly pace, you know, to, to kind of meet what current expectations are. Those dark blue lines are what the soybean sales have been to date. And so you can just see that so far soybean exports have just been off the chart fantastic in the U.S. And so, you know, just again a reflection of how strong soybean demand is. And, you know, where there's that great big, you know, jump up in ending stocks and corn, you know, it's, it's not that way for soybeans this year. We have some concerns as we get into the following year. But uh, in the interim, you know, the, 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 all I wanted to illustrate with, with this slide is just how impressive soybean export demand has been. Will it continue to, uh, you know, go at that pace? You know, that's a question mark. We're always fighting the clock a little bit with things like soybeans in the U.S., which, which again, you know, backs into, you know, what goes on in our canola market. Just because once that South American crumb crop comes off and they actually start getting it to market, you know, that's, that's when we're no longer the, you know, the, the, the main supplier. So it is a bit of a race, you know, in terms of, of fighting the, the, the calendar a little bit, but certainly it's been very, very impressive for soybeans. And so that's, you know, one of the reasons why, why soybean prices have actually been, been pretty good, which again, there's some spillover effect into, into canola. Canola, uh, big crop, um, you know, just a whisker under 18 million tons here this morning reported by StatsCan. A huge increase over what their previous estimate was. Their previous et estimate everyone knew was way too low. Uh, we had been guessing ourselves about a 17.6 or 17.7 million crop, and we were probably pretty close to the high end of the range. We thought our, our estimate was pretty aggressive, and StatsCan came out with an even bigger number, and I don't think they're too high. I think that's probably pretty, pretty fair and reasonable about what the size of the, the canola crop is. Again, you know, demand has been very good for, for canola, which, which really, really helps. Strong crush demand, a good export program, all those things make a big difference. Uh, but you know, the residual effect of having a big crop, wider basis levels, and carrying the futures, and uh, you know, that's, that's just what we can expect here going forward in canola. This is a graph of canola futures here in the January futures chart. And I, I kind of put this graph together a number of days ago just to get the presentation in. And just wanted to illustrate, you know, kind of how we've been grinding along in a sideways range here for such a long time. Again, a reflection of the fact that the volatility has just leaked right out of this market. We're kind of supported a little bit by this soybean complex. Kind of got a ceiling over top of us by uh, the fact that we just got a ton of this stuff around. Um, with a stats can report today, we actually were pushing through the bottom end of that range a little bit, although we've sort of stabilized a bit. We'll see where the market closes today, you know, so I'd be a little concerned if we got follow through to the downside of this a little bit. You know, technically that wouldn't be very good, but, uh, you know, the market didn't seem to gag too much on the big stats can number. I, I think most in the trade were thinking, you know, big crop, they got it, that's kind of confirmed. Uh, so, but, but we'll see. But ju again, just a reflection of a, a fairly sort of steady, flat, sideways, quite frankly, kind of boring market in terms of, of canola. Here's just a graph of basis levels, and again, just coming around to the point. This is for uh, Saskatoon area, uh, which is uh, the, the delivery region for, uh, uh, for the futures contract. 
just you know, just showing over the last, uh, and this, this graph goes back to about 2002, just sort of where those basis levels had been historically over the last couple of years, way above what would be considered historically normal, and now we're right getting right back down into that range where we historically have been. And, and again, just a reflection of the fact that even with strong demand for canola, you know, with this big crop, we're gonna, you know, we'll, we'll restock supplies here uh, to, to, to a large extent. And, and so until that changes, which uh, isn't going to happen this crop year, and, and who knows who knows when it will. You know, we can probably expect reasonably historically normal basis levels, maybe even worse. Speaking of wheat here a little bit, you know, world production of wheat is, is record large, but not you know that much bigger than what we have seen uh, before in the past. One of the problems a little bit with wheat is that in the past couple of years we fed so much wheat because the price of, of wheat was relatively low compared to corn. Like for example, last year during the crop year, the Chicago wheat futures and the corn futures were you know kind of trading either side of parity for a lot of the time on the on the nearby futures. Well now that wheat contract is you know two and a half bucks a bushel higher than the corn futures, right? No market incentive anymore to feed wheat. So uh, you know and I mean you know Chicago futures to futures maybe isn't completely reflective of what's going on worldwide, but it's a pretty decent barometer. Point being you know, we may be done growing that much more wheat worldwide than we have been in the past. Certainly, there's elements of demand that have been pretty good, pretty good export demand recently. In terms of the whole bigger picture, we're just not going to feed as much of it, so, you know, demand overall will be softer because the, the math is changing on corn. You know, again, that impact of corn and, and how everything else gets impacted. This is uh, U.S. wheat ending stocks, so again, coming back to ending stocks with the wheat. Just to reflect that actually wheat is kind of neutral-ish if you look at it just on its own right in many ways. Uh, you know, corn or wheat in the U.S., not really tight, but certainly not that heavy. Um, the problem with wheat, this is our ending stocks here in Western Canada. This is, this is what we're projecting for ending stocks in Western Canada. And actually, this was again done, you know, a number of days ago with this new StatsCan number on wheat that we got today, which was, was way higher than anyone was expecting from a production perspective. That bar at the end, you know, with that big buildup in ending stocks for our own wheat, it's going to be even bigger. Unfortunately, we're just going to be sitting on an enormous amount of wheat here in Western Canada, and it's not going to—it's not all going to move. And that's going to be our challenge this year with, in Western Canada with wheat. I mean, we've been hearing for a couple of months elevators booked out till May, June, not buying anything till April, right? We got lots of farms that we talked to that got lots of grain sitting in bags. It's going to have to move at some point. It's not priced. It's not. You know, doesn't have a home for it yet. Lots and bins. There's a lot of wheat around, and our, our concern, our concern with the wheat, is that we're going to have a hard time finding a home for all that. It's it's just not it's just not going to move. I, I, not all the wheat is going to move, and and that's and that's that's uh, a little bit of a challenge. So, you know, certainly, uh, and, and we talked about constraints earlier on. You know, from uh, the the kind of conversations we're having with some of our clients is if you got wheat that's not sold, and you absolutely have to move that by. April, for example, you know, maybe those selling decisions, you know, don't matter a whole lot about higher or lower. Maybe it's can you find a home for it? Can, will someone actually take it? You know, and, and that's just an honest conversation we're having. You know, well, time will tell. This, so this is what I did in this graph, just to illustrate a little bit some of the challenges. So one of the things that we do when we, you know, we look at these markets, analyze them fundamentally, and so on. You know, we got to have some mathematical realities. If I think, what, you know, if I think that okay. You know what, prices are going to go higher. Like, you know, we can't just close our eyes, clench our fists, click our heels, and say it's got to go higher because it's just, it's not, it's too low. It's got to go higher. No, we, we need something to work with here. We need some reason why it's going to go higher. What I have with this graph is basically the exports over a period of time for the, the six biggest crops in Western Canada that we export, of which wheat and, and canola are the, are the biggest ones. And so you can see, you know, our forecast for the current crop year is record exports across all of these crops, which in and of itself is a, you know, is, is a, you know, is a, is a you know is a good thing. The problem is we're going to have record exports, and we're still going to be left with an enormous amount of grain. We're still going to you know so that big bar that we had for the wheat at the end of the wheat, that's even after we export all this grain. You know, and and the same for oats and the same for barley. And canola has a buildup in carryout and peas, right? So, you know, do we have the ability to export more than what we already have penciled in? Well, I don't think so because we're already looking at record exports. We're already behind on movement. We're moving more oil by rail than we ever have, which taxes logistics. We've been exporting soybeans, which taxes logistics. We're crushing more canola in Western Canada and consuming more of it in Western Canada ourselves, which impacts logistics. And it, sometimes it comes down to the fact that even if someone, you know, overseas wants our wheat, 
it doesn't do us much good if we can't actually move, move it there, if we can't physically get it there. And so, you know, yes, record exports, this in and of itself is not bullish because even after this, we're still sitting with an enormous amount of grain on farm. And so, you know, that, that's one of the challenges. Now, I don't know, maybe, maybe, I mean, the economic incentive is there to, to uh, you know, for these grain companies to move the wheat. I mean, some of the margins that, uh, that is get, being earned by a company who buys it from the farmer, moves it all the way through, dumps it out the spout on a boat on the other end, so our full pipeline margins are pretty attractive, you know. So it's not that the margins aren't there to move it. But at the end of the day, if the cars aren't there, or if the cars show up and you can't move them when you want to, you know, there's not much you can do about it. And, and so that's a bit of a concern and a bit of a challenge that, that I think we have here going forward. The movement's, movement's definitely a bit of a challenge. Okay, so those are the things that we know. You know, and then there's also the element of the known knowns or the, or the known unknowns, the things where, you can, where it's you know, kind of about probability, right? You know, and poker is, you know, isn't really a game of chance, it's a game about odds and probability, right? And so, you know, the, the sort of the known unknowns are the things that we don't know exactly how they're going to play out, but we can kind of have some idea or, or we at least know to watch for them and, and we can, you know, we can kind of estimate some probabilities and adjust our, adjust our, our plans uh, uh, accordingly. And, and typically, you know, as we go forward, it's, you know, it's weather and demand. And we're kind of in a window of time where there aren't that many fundamental things that change a whole lot until we start getting into the growing cycle again for the Northern Hemisphere. So there's not a lot of new fundamental things that we're going to see in the coming months. But uh, some of the things we're watching for, I mean, the biggest one is weather. And if you think about, you know, what is going to change this great big pile of grain that we have, corn, wheat, other crops, you know, it takes time. It takes time to work that down. How much time? Well, it depends. You know, if we have weather issues, we forget how many weather issues we had to drive those numbers down to such low levels, you know, and how fast can we drive those ending stocks and these crops down to a, a more bullish uh, level? Well, you know, if, if we get a bunch of weather problems again, you know, it might take less time than, you know, than, than it might. And, and that's certainly possible. We don't know what the weather's going to be. Drew Learner's pretty good, but, you know, if he can tell us, you know, exactly what you can expect for corn yields next year and the year after, the year after, I mean, that's, you know, I don't know if he's that good. But, uh, so, you know, weather is a key one here going forward, and so within that we also, as we look forward, we sort of have to assume normal weather. You have to assume normal weather until you, you know, kind of, you know, show me otherwise. Uh, we also know there are certain areas of the world that are more susceptible to weather problems than others. So, for example, in South America, Brazil does not have weather issues very often. Yes, they did a couple of years ago, which helped our soybean story. Doesn't happen that often. Argentina, a little more often, you know, but so far they're off to a decent start in South America. Middle East, North Africa, which impacts wheat and, and you know, has a big impact on Durham. You know, they're kind of hit and miss. They do have their weather issues, but not all, all the time. Uh, the Northern Hemisphere, US and Canada, we have our weather issues at times. Of course, we had this you know, big drought in the US, you know, not this last year, the year before, which you know, really was the, the driver of that, that corn story. Europe don't have major weather issues that often. You know, Black Sea region, you know, they're, they're more susceptible to having drought and sort of boom or bust on the production side. So, you know, as we look ahead and say, okay, what's going to, you know, pull that pile down, make that pile smaller, we need some weather challenges somewhere. And so we can kind of look at some of these plays and say, who knows what's going to happen? But, you know, are we going to sit there and hope and pray for a weather wreck in Brazil? It's probably not going to happen. It's probably not going to happen. It might, and we'll change your plans accordingly if it does. But, you know, if that's what we're banking on, it's probably not going to happen. You know, wheat, Black Sea region, you know, maybe a bit of a higher likelihood. Again, you can't bank on a higher likelihood. doesn't mean that two or three years it's a wreck. You know, but we can water these things, engage them a little bit, and try and have some, some understanding a little bit about what we think is, is maybe going to potentially be the case. What are the probabilities? How do we adjust accordingly? You know, demand is, is one that also is, is, you know, can change going forward. It, it doesn't fluctuate a whole lot. Um, again, as I mentioned, strong demand for oil seeds. Is that Chinese demand at risk? You know, that would be a bit of a concern. India, um, huge, huge destination for pulse demand, which obviously impacts peas and, and, and lentils. Always a big wild card. Uh, huge producer of pulses, huge consumer of pulses. And for them to, to import you know, those extra few cargoes of peas because they want to and it helps fill a gap. I mean, for them, it's like a rounding error. For us, it could completely change, you know, can impact our market in a significant way. Uh, but it's always a big wild card in terms of, of India. They'll, they'll buy a lot. It's not a matter of them, will they buy any or, or a, they'll buy a lot. It's just are they going to buy enough to, to soak up all these extra peas that we got. You know, they've had foreign exchange volatility. They've got key elections coming up and stuff like that. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a wild card in terms of, of India. Uh, you know, in terms of the cereals and the feed grains, you know, it's, uh, 
it's hard to know where, again, where is that demand going to come from? Maybe exports, but here in Western Canada, we got the logistical issues, right? We're already looking at, at having big exports and yet still not working that pile down enough. You know, in the U.S., they've got great exports for corn. Are they going to be able to move enough corn out that we're able to actually, you know, kind of stop this grind lower in prices? I don't know. That's a lot of corn you got to move. So maybe, you know, but but it's uh, that's that's a bit of a challenge. Again, you know, with demand that's lost, you don't just get it back overnight. And to try and get new demand, you got to buy that demand. You buy demand through lower prices, you know. So that's one of the things that that we're watching. But again, you know, we've we've definitely seen values lower. Maybe we can unlock some demand. Maybe there is some new demand that ends up coming up, and, and sort of quietly in a sneaky way, we end up consuming more of these big crops than we anticipated. It, it's possible, but. Uh, whether we're going to be able to do that in a substantial enough way to kind of move the needle from a fundamental perspective and turn prices higher and more bullish, you know, that's a little bit more debatable. You know, and the last part of it is the unknown unknowns. These are the things you don't see coming, right? These are the ones that sort of totally catch you off guard and you never, you never thought it was, you know, like where did that come from? And, and they just happen, right? You know, they just happen. You know, government policy is, is one of the biggest ones, right? Whether it's, it's flax and triffid, whether it's canola and blackleg, whether it's BSE and cattle, you know, it, it's, you, know, you, you just don't know. You can't make marketing decisions in fear of what might possibly happen, and yet you also can't have your head in the sand about it. You know, the other one is, is uh, you know, one of the things that I, I wonder about is just this whole macroeconomic policy that, that's been going on. I mean, we really are in the biggest macro or monetary policy experiment that the world has ever seen. I mean, there's all kinds of graphs. You can look at it a hundred different ways. This is a graph of, of uh, the monetary base in the U.S., you know, basically since about 2008 or 2009, they've just been, it's just been a fire hose of money they've been plump, pumping into the, into the economy. I mean, I don't have a PhD from, from Harvard. I don't have an advanced degree in physics from Yale, so maybe these guys know a whole lot more than I do. I'm sure they do. But you see something like this, and you see it in the U.S., you see it in England, you see it all in Japan and everywhere else. What are the odds of these guys doing it and not cocking something up and having real bad happen? Maybe, right? Maybe, but I, I don't know. I mean, this has been going on for a lot longer than people would have guessed, and we haven't had any real adverse reactions yet in a big way. It might not happen at all. It might not happen for five years. It might happen next week. Uh, I don't know. You know, people look at that chart, they, you know, it's probably more like this, you know, where really what these guys are doing is blowing up asset bubbles all over the place is, is what it is. You know, they're just, you know, the, 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 uh, Distortions that go on in markets, what these guys are doing, and maybe that's maybe that's better than the alternative of not printing money. And all I know is that it's it's from a, a financial market perspective, and and it, you know there's there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of how that's going to play out, and it it can't help but not have at least some type of impact in terms of what would happen on grain prices if you know if things go squirrely. Might not happen, but it might. And so again, it's kind of one of those unknowns that, that you just don't know how exactly it's going gonna, it's gonna to play out. But, but certainly there's been a lot of imbalances in financial markets that have been pushed in as a result of, of, of this kind of uh, increase in the money supply. So I guess just, just, just kind of wrap up here with a couple of comments. You know, we, we just really are in a different environment here than we have been the last few years. And, and it's one that it, it, might not, it might not change that quickly. Right, if we, you know, we can sit there and talk about weather and the reasons why maybe that stockpile at the end gets whittled down, or maybe, maybe we end up having another year or two of good production and that pile stays the same or keeps getting bigger and the cycle continues, right? And, and that's, I think, as real a risk as, uh, you know, as, as having it work down and prices making it turn higher. And so, you know, we, we have to just be realistic about that. We have to be real about that when we think about the marketing decisions. There's no quick fixes. You can hope for, bad, hope for bad weather. I guess wish ill will on someone else, quite frankly, I guess, right? But, you know, it could happen. You know, we can't bank on it from a marketing perspective, you know? So certainly the conversations that, that Chris is having with his clients, our marketing advisors, all of us are having with our clients are a lot more. In the last couple of years, it's been, you know, how high can it go? Can it go even higher yet? Yeah, and then maybe it did and it can and all that sort of stuff. And now it's a lot more talking about margins. You know, we're looking at, at more in different ways of trying to manage risk. We're having more conversations about futures and options with growers about, you know, do we need to have more ways and more tools of, of, of managing our risk because, you know, it, it's just a, it's just a, a, a different environment and, and we need to make our marketing decisions, you know, a, a accordingly. So anyway, with, with that, uh, um, you know, I, I think 
I maybe have just a very quick minute or two for a couple more questions or a, if there's any if there's any questions uh, and again I'm, I'm around all day Chris is around all day um, you know so we're certainly happy to chat but if anyone has a question or two that uh, uh, they want to ask it in, uh, in the moment then I'm certainly happy to happy to take any questions or any any comments or people that adamantly disagree with anything that I just said <laughs> Okay, yeah, if anyone didn't hear the question, ethanol policies in the U.S., you know, one of the things that's happened, and, and uh, you know, one of those, I guess, if we had a little more time, you could flesh out some of these stories in a lot more detail. One of the things that's happened with corn is we had this huge ramp up in, in demand in corn, you know, which is why this, you know, uh, uh, you know, supplies are tight, supplies are tight. Ethanol uh, consumption of corn is basically plateaued. You know, we sort of bumped up what they call the blend wall. Basically, you know, it's not like that demand growth. There's not really, it's not growing demand anymore. It doesn't mean that they still don't consume a lot of the crop. They consume a huge amount of the crop, but it's not growing anymore, and now production is caught up. You know, so whereas in the past that was a huge source of demand growth, now it's, now it's kind of flat. And, you know, are they going to ramp that up again? I, I don't know. I think some of the, from a, whether you love ethanol, whether you hate it, there's no rational debate. You know, it's like having, you know, a flames oilers conversation in Red Deer or something like that. There's no rational conversation about it. You're one or the other, and, and it comes to blows. It's not about love or hate ethanol, but the reality is that some of the, uh, some of the bloom, I think, has come off of that rose politically. So the appetite to ramp it up even more, I don't think, is there. So I think we can probably expect ethanol uh, consumption of the corn relatively flat within a range at a high level, but it's probably not grown. So that's not where new demand growth, I think, is going to come. I, I'd be surprised. Kansas, Kansas wheat futures trading in a premium to Minneapolis wheat futures. Yeah, that's where, been... Where is that, where is that coming out? When, when we're hearing the, that there's protein shortages, that's... I, I'm, yeah, I'm well, that. yeah, you know, one of the challenges is it's, you know, it's a function of just, uh, you know, we had an enormous wheat crop up here. I mean, we just did... We, we have one of our advisors that works through Central uh, Central uh, Saskatchewan, and he has a lot of clients. He covers a lot of area, and he, he's a you know, reasonably understated individual. He's sort of matter of fact. He's not one to sit there and, you know, get all panicky about this or uh, whatever. And the word he used to describe cereal yields was explosive. And I think today's uh, StatsCan report showed that. And, you know, they had that in, in the U.S. as well. So, you know, I mean, the spring wheat crop has just, you know, has just been, been huge. So, yeah, you know, to certainly do a point with the, you know, with, with the protein um, premiums, but, but that doesn't necessarily all show up in, in uh, futures necessarily. Some of that might show up in basis or, or in protein premiums at the elevator on the cash side. It doesn't necessarily show up on the future side. So I think given the huge spring wheat crop, you know, and, and it's relatively tighter for the hard red winter. I think, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to continue to see that. Uh, that'll probably correct somewhat as we get into, into next year, especially if we have a, have a decent hard red winter crop. And we'll probably lose a lot of hard red spring wheat acres, quite frankly, in Western Canada. In our opinion, we're going we're gonna to have a whole more canola, big canola acres next year. We're going to lose quite a bit of hard red spring wheat, in our opinion. So that'll help maybe bring some of that balance back in line. Thank you. Good. Thanks very much.